This is the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. My name is Angelica Salitska. I am your host. And today I'm joined by David Meachin. Thank you, David, for joining. Um, so David is a senior lecturer in education and a parent to a four and a six year old, um, which is really important to mention because today we are talking about the reception baseline assessment. So um, David has done a lot of uh, work around this, so some research and writing, and he's also been personally involved with his own children. So we're going to be discussing the challenges of the baseline assessment and how we move forward from those challenges. So um, David, I thought it would be good if you start off with a little introduction, I guess, of how you got involved with anything to do with the reception baseline, basically. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Um, so it actually started, I was um, lecturing on the reception baseline with some um, early childhood students. Mm-hmm. And I, for, for a number of years, um, set up a, you know, used to have a debate on the pros and cons. And mm-hmm. students would go, you know, would be either for it or against it. And it was... Um, one year, the students actually turned around and said, isn't your child going to have to do this next year? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, and the penny dropped, and I really went, wow, I, I kind of really don't feel comfortable about this. And mm. I, I don't know how much about the history you know of the reception baseline, but the current statutory one that was introduced in 2021 is the third kind of iteration um, mm. of reception baseline assessments in terms of statutory. There was an attempt in 2015, which um, wasn't successful, um, although there was some very successful results of the, the pilot um, around a more informal observation-based one. Um, it was then reinstigated um and so it was being made uh, statutory in 2020 but it was delayed because of the pandemic and my son started school in 2021 so yeah um that was kind of a lecture part and then as a parent mm-hmm. i was beginning to think well i really don't feel comfortable with my son going in and being you know facing this test because it is a test mm-hmm. i mean they call yeah. it an assessment it's a test um you know no matter how many teachers i've spoken to about it it's it's a test but it's packaged mm-hmm. very nicely um as nicely as it can be um so i requested um to withdraw my son from it um i made a request with the school um the teacher, um, his class teacher, was uh, very understanding, um, understood my mm-hmm. reservations around it, um, and initially agreed that I could withdraw him. So I was like, yeah, great, you know. <laughs> Quite well, easy. Well, not though. so great. <laughs> well, yeah, but but not so great. And it wasn't actually just, I mean, my son, I knew he would be okay, whatever happened. But I thought, mm-hmm. oh, you know, in terms of principles, I need to make this stand mm-hmm. now. Um, yeah. Because parents just weren't aware and still aren't aware of reception baseline assessment and its statutory nature and its testing nature. Um, I had did have to stop myself from going out and flying yeah. on a playground, you know, that first week. Do you know your child is going to be tested in the next six weeks? Because I didn't think it was a very good introduction to the school. So um <laughs> probably not. But, no, but uh I so I made this request. Initially it was accepted, and then the head teacher promptly within the second or third day of being at school asked to have a word and said unfortunately they weren't he you know they weren't able to withdraw my my son from the reception baseline assessment because it was a statutory test Mm. so I initially said okay but then I still it, it didn't it just didn't still didn't sit well with me um and I started to make some inquiries and I came across more than a score campaign. Um, mm-hmm. They campaign a lot around uh, SATs and, you know, testing. Um, mm-hmm. And they were really, uh, you know, very great for, for me reaching out. Um, and they put me in touch. Um, oh, sorry. Initially, they advised me that there had been some successful situations where parents had withdrawn their children from a reception baseline assessment so Mm -hmm. what that showed initially was that there was 
differing approaches to yeah. what was meant to be a statutory assessment. Um, and so in some local authorities, parents had successfully done it. Um, mm -hmm. But in my case, it was escalated uh, by the head teacher to the local authority and the local authority came back and said, no, um, mm -hmm. I couldn't be, that my son couldn't be withdrawn. Um, I, <laughs> um, again, it wasn't me being, well, it probably was me being a difficult parent for, for, <laughs> for school. Um I, I was really apologetic to the head about it and he was really understanding and he was, mm -hmm. you know, actually really supportive. He said, no, he said, it's, it's important that we ask these questions. And mm -hmm. he actually said, I'm learning just as much about this process as you are. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the beginning of the term. So I said, look, it's a new academic year. I know you, you've got a million and one things to do as head teachers always have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really grateful that you're taking the time to, you know, look into this with me um i was then put in touch with an organization called defend digital me who um mm -hmm. campaign for um, the protection of, of children's kind of digital footprints and anything to do mm -hmm. with um digital aspects of children's lives um and they put me in touch with a solicitor actually and i was able to seek legal aid and mount mm -hmm. a legal challenge or, or begin exploring a legal challenge um around my son having to do this um, assessment um, but it was short this went on for nine months after he'd done wow. it and I then kind of yeah so it went on for nine months backwards and forwards with the department for education <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and essentially they turned around and said um, we see all of your reservations we acknowledge them all but we're still going to do it anyway um, <laughs> but the process itself was really interesting yeah. um, and I learned a lot from that um, so that was kind of, yeah, as a parent. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time as all of this going on, though, in terms of my role as an academic, mm -hmm. I was thinking there's some real moral issues I have here with the mm -hmm. testing side. Um, yeah. You know, I, I trained as a teacher, um, you know, as an early years teacher. So for me, assessment was always about, you know, you assess a child, the child gets feedback, you get feedback, and then you move on from that assessment point. Mm -hmm. And that assessment might be an observation, it might be, you know, a reflection, it could be a piece of work, could be anything. Um, but the idea is that there's always a feedback loop in mm -hmm. the assessment process. Yeah. So the, the reception baseline assessment is there isn't a feedback loop mm -hmm. for the child. So that's something there useful a, for the child to take away from that. Yeah. There isn't a feedback loop for the teacher and there isn't mm -hmm. a feedback loop for the parent. The So my son had took the test and I asked for the, you know, the I think you get a line on literacy mm -hmm. and a line on numeracy. Um, very um, general. Um, nothing really specific to kind of work with. Um, so I very quickly thought, I'm not sure about this. I really wonder how teachers are feeling about this mm, yeah um and so then I, I reached out to some colleagues and said i'd, I'd like to do a, a national survey while well, surveying kind of get as many responses as possible um around teachers kind of inputs um and feelings on reception baseline assessment um and the more i started to look into it the more information i found um especially from people like Professor Alice Bradbury, um, mm. and who would looked into kind of a datification of children yeah. um, and schools and primary schooling and so on. Um, mm. And the more I began to think, actually, this is really, really wrong. Mm. Um, and there's mm. no resistance. There's no over resistance, um, you know, at all. It's it's almost like teachers. Not that there isn't some some resistance, and I'll come on mm -hmm. to that in, in a bit when I talk about the research findings, because there, there definitely was. Um, mm -hmm. But teachers are literally the voice of teachers and their expertise, and especially the expertise within, you know, the early years and that yeah. transition into formal schooling. This top-down assessment, which initially mm -hmm. was meant to cover literacy, numeracy, and self-regulation because self-regulation mm -hmm. is a really good indication of um, later achievement um, mm -hmm. for children. But the self-regulation aspect of, the, of the, the baseline was dropped because it was unreliable. Um, mm -hmm. So again, you've got this, initially it seemed like a, 
an acknowledgement of actually these four-year-olds, some of them mm-hmm. who've just turned four in the last week before they come into that reception class, you know, or two weeks, yeah, yeah <laughs> are coming in. And then within the first six weeks of schooling, they're being assessed on literacy and numeracy. Mm-hmm, um, away, so, yeah. f- and- so f- some of those might have come from home. Mm-hmm. The majority now probably would have had some sort of input um, in terms of kind of more formal um, education, whether that's from a private day nursery, a child minder, um, or a nursery kind of um, at a school. Mm-hmm. But still, it's almost like I felt it'd be like me being given a, I don't know, a German test tomorrow and I've mm-hmm. never learned German at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something really mm-hmm. kind of, well, oh, but what's all yeah. this about? And all that because... pressure of that transition, that's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah. Even if they are perhaps seen as very competent, perhaps in literacy and maths, you know, in in their setting or at home, and maybe quite confident in themselves, when they go into a new environment with new people and everything's quite formal, then that's completely different. Yeah, and, and actually, you know, they're still within the early years foundation stage, which is, you mm-hmm. know, seven areas of learning, um, three prime areas, which hopefully they've got really good foundations in by that mm-hmm. age. But, but you know, there are lots of children across the country who haven't, mm-hmm. you know, and it's almost um, – so the other interesting thing I found is that when I couldn't withdraw my son from a reception baseline, um, we were told that if – Children could be withdrawn by the head teachers um, if they were um, identified as having uh, additional needs and send mm-hmm. and so on. Um, but there would still be a data entry against that child's name for the reasons why they weren't entered into the statutory baseline assessment. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And this is where Defend Digital Me came in. So all this data mm-hmm. all of a sudden is being collected on children that parents have no idea about. Mm, yeah. It's not you know, necessarily, and, are they being asked that, um, are they given a choice, I guess, but they just don't have any clue that this is going on. No, it's part and parcel of, of your child starting school. You literally mm-hmm. sign away their kind of data footprint of, um, you know, there's, I don't know how much you know about the national data, um, no, national pupil database, mm-hmm. um, which essentially now is tracking children from, you know, from, a very young age all the way through to kind of their 20s um okay. you know so all this mm-hmm. big data is being collected essentially on our children the statutory baseline assessment data is meant to be ring fenced from this national pupil database mm-hmm. um but this whole datafication aspect is something i became really interesting in you know looking at mm-hmm. what data are they collecting and why and actually what data aren't they collecting um, so things like the self-regulation um, mm. baseline being dropped. Now, anybody who works with with children or, or you know pupils across primary school will know mm. most behaviour issues will become will come from a lack of um, self-regulation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, so so we know how essential these core skills are from a very mm-hmm. younger age, but we're choosing not to assess them because it's not reliable. Um, but it doesn't mean that you say, okay, right, well, we're, we're going to look at different types of assessments because actually what what is need was needed and is needed in the current way the systems work is, you know, a standardised national test. So every mm-hmm. child, you know, unless there's mitigating circumstances, under, undergoes this, this test and assessment. Mm-hmm. Um, so you literally come back to the old tried and tested academic kind of rooted literacy numeracy um Mm -hmm. and again you know these top-down pressures and especially since the shift in national curriculum has gone to a knowledge-based curriculum um from 2013 you know the legacy of michael gove um Mm -hmm. and his his reforms um you know you just see those downward pressures coming on to the early year sector you know we've got a really strong vibrant early year sector in england um mm. that's managed to to hold and, and keep its identity um throughout all the disasters of marketization and, and so on mm. that's gone on i mean we still have a very fractured se- sector but we still have a you know a, a strong identity as, as a whole um that we are not knowledge based you know that we are mm. kind of processes and skills are really um, important but fundamentally what you see the reception baseline is a, a total contrast of what their mm. 
assessing to what children have experienced um, prior to entering reception. So in terms of the, just going back to self-regulation, not being reliable, is that because it's so difficult to measure because it's quite subjective rather than, you know, numerical and objective? Yeah, I, I'd say it's um, it's it's very nuanced um, and actually self-regulation. Um, um, if you look at the work of Mini Konkabai, you know, it's not mm-hmm. self-regulation as, as well as co-regulation, so mm-hmm. relationships attachments yeah. you know this is all very basic for for any um, early childhood student across the country you know we know about this we know it's basic child development but there seems to be a real disconnect with schools and not so much schools sorry the, the systems that are in place mm-hmm. and the curriculum expectations in schools when it comes to um, knowledge of child development and how um, developmentally appropriate um, are certain approaches um, for four-year-olds um, and, and I mean, another exam, example from my initial experiences, and actually I'm seeing it at the moment as my daughter's just started school, mm-hmm. um, the amount of children who are struggling just to separate from their main caregiver mm-hmm. in the morning, yeah. you know, to get into reception class. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, what we're into the second week here, um, I was six weeks into my son starting reception and there were still children and not just children, but parents, you know, they were distraught mm, leaving yeah. those children walking away. Um, and I just, again, thought, who, whoever's thought of this standardised assessment, when was the last time they stood on the playground at this time of the year and actually looked at these, you know, these precursors to children coming in? And, and is it really, um, you know, are the children's best interests at heart, which, you know, is essentially when it comes to a children's rights-based approach, which is Mm -hmm. really quite foundational to lots of the work I do. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you have the right to provision, to protection and participation. You know, are these factors encouraging children to participate um, in school? Um, Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, who does the reception baseline assessment? the class teacher, and Mm -hmm. where do they do it? not in the classroom because the child's taken out um you know so that was another huge area that actually came through from the research was you know teachers are re- really dissatisfied um not only with having to do the assessment which was developmentally not appropriate for the majority of children mm-hmm. um but actually they were being taken out of their classrooms in mm-hmm. the first six weeks of schooling to do this assessment just quickly i wanted to thank all the listeners for tuning into the voice of early childhood podcast those of you who are regular listeners will know that a new episode comes out every monday morning ready for your commute morning coffee or that reflective start to the week to get you thinking and in the zone If you haven't already done so, it would really help this podcast to keep going if you subscribe to the channel that you're listening on. The Voice of Early Childhood podcast can be found on 19 different podcast platforms and on YouTube. So it's highly likely that you, your friends and colleagues can find it on your favourite streaming platform. So please do hit the subscribe button and this will help us to keep putting out thought-provoking, reflective and insightful episodes with a wide range of guests. Thank you. I'll let you get back to the episode now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a real huge um, challenge. Mm -hmm. So so in terms, as you've just mentioned, one of the findings, what were your, I guess, key findings um, from your research around the baseline? Um. Interestingly, so the, as I said, the, the research um, was a survey, so there was 70 responses um, mm-hmm. from, and they represented, well, they came from 47 different local authorities across the country. So we had a real kind of widespread mm-hmm. response. Yeah. Um, most of them were teachers who were directly involved in administrating the reception baseline assessment, so had first-hand knowledge of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the questions was uh, asked them to rate how valuable um, the reception baseline was for children, for parents, for um, teachers, for head teachers, for the mm-hmm. local authority and for Department for Education. Because actually these are all the kind of stakeholders in terms mm-hmm. of or yeah. should have been all the stakeholders in an, in an assessment for children. Um, 
there was no value attributed to children, to, for children undertaking a test, mm-hmm. assessment, sorry. There was no value attributed for parents um, in terms of, you know, the assessment. So going back to that mm-hmm. feedback loop, yeah. there was very, there was minimal value attributed for teachers because actually they do the test and then all, because it's done on, and, and, you know, a tablet, an iPad, mm-hmm. all that data sent off. They don't have access to it, to actually that, mm. any of that raw data. To reflect back um, on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. Minimal in uh, value for the um, head teachers. Um, and then when you get to kind of a local authority and department for education, the response is starting to say, well, maybe there is more value for, um, for the local authority and more mm-hmm. value for, the DFE. So that was really quite a start finding because the teachers themselves are saying, this isn't of any use to us, mm-hmm. but we're spending a significant proportion of our first six weeks with our new cohorts of children outside of our class administering this. Mm-hmm. So that was a real, you know, it's a real concern um, because it's essentially treating children as a means to the end, means mm-hmm. to an end. You know, not on a means in themselves, yeah. um, and and the reason for that is is the reception baseline, how it's going to be used by the government it's to track um, cohort level progress, so school level progress, mm-hmm. um, is it will then be compared to level uh, year six SATS results, um, and looking mm-hmm. at the progress that that children make in a school, um, not individually, um, but it will give mm-hmm. the government intends for them for it to give them a good overview of actually this school's this school's really good because children make really good progress between the first six weeks of reception and their SATs um, Mm -hmm. in you know in May of year six a big issue with this is we've now got to wait so for my son he's just gone into year two um, Mm -hmm. I haven't asked a question actually yet but I will you know um, this should reduce the burden so key stage uh, one um, year two SATs should not be happening this year um Mm. and by the time he gets to year six they'll then look back at this reception baseline data and go oh look that's how much progress his cohort has made in Mm. this school okay um now again the academic in me thinking if i went to an ethics board and said right i'm going to do some research about children which has no direct benefit for those children and i'm going to wait for six years to then tell you about not just the individual children but the group of children and f- mm-hmm. and how they're doing at school i'm i'm not sure any ethics board <laughs> would <laughs> actually give me permission to okay. undertake that research so again i was really thinking like you know and this kind of the solicitors were really good when I kind of put in the the evidence together and some of my kind of oppositions and um but they, they're very honest they says you know what's right and what's you know what's morally right and what's legal it can mm-hmm. often be two different things in this country um and I mean and that really rang home um with me because I thought wow god yeah it's uh I wouldn't like to be a solicitor put it that mm-hmm. way but um <laughs> it was so all all of this just kind of all connected up um and the research just really kind of reaffirmed some of the initial concerns I had, but also um, some of the anecdotal information I was getting from from teachers um, who I know and who you know um, and worked with, and even um, students. So I, I teach um, or have taught you know um, students who are teaching assistants in reception mm-hmm. classes, and you know, and they were having to cover the class whilst the teacher was out mm. and uh, they were meant to get additional support but the additional support didn't come in so sometimes you'd have like you know one teaching assistant with 20 odd new children new, whilst yeah. the teacher had to go out and do you know really um i mean we know the strains that are on the education sector and the earlier sector already you know and he was like god these are increased strains mm-hmm. um and this is being you know this is compulsory um so yeah i I mean i think it's really important to to talk about how to how teachers were navigating this Mm -hmm. um because um whether they liked it or not teachers have to have to do it um and so from the study the biggest kind of findings were um there were some really creative um 
solutions as always um mm -hmm. you know i think hardship always brings creativity yeah. um and teachers and early practitioners are never short of that mm -hmm. um Definitely. quite a, a few respondents were saying that you know their priority was the children so they really focused mm -hmm. on getting to know the children in the first two to three weeks and actually mm -hmm. kind of shelved the reception baseline assessment for, for the so latter half just quickly for those that don't know yep. how long is that period that when it when our teachers required to have done the assessment by so the statutory requirements of that each child undertakes it within the first six weeks of starting mm -hmm. reception year um generally so that means you know september so the first six weeks mm -hmm. into first half term basically mm -hmm. um but there might be exceptions where children don't start the reception year until later in the year and they would then be required to undertake this within the first six weeks of their schooling mm. um, so many teachers then were navigating it by making sure that they kind of leave it as long as possible basically to ensure that they like you said they get to know the children and then the the reception based on assessment is kind of least of their priorities and they kind of try and get it done within that time frame yeah. Um, you know, which, again, the priority there was all about establishing the rapport, the relationships. Mm -hmm. um, some of the benefits that, that had been previously cited in literature of the reception baseline assessment were that um, taking children out on a one to one basis um, gave the teacher opportunities to get to know that child. Mm -hmm. um, but again, a, a criticism of that is that most schools and settings would have equally had internal baseline assessments that they were undertaking prior to this and still undertake now alongside this um, that enable practitioners and teachers to get to know the children. Mm, um, so their own kind of um, baselines, and not which aren't assessments, but just them trying to get to know the child and where their starting point yeah. is in order to support that child, not for other yeah. Data yeah, and, and and generally they're far more um, reflective of that child's prior learning experiences. You know, it might be mm -hmm. things that look at thing, you know, like fine motor skills, gross motor skills. Um, you know, the PSE side. Um, how are they? You know, separating from their caregiver, um, the peer to peer relationships, um, mm -hmm. and so on. So, so yeah, lots of um, a, a far more um, holistic kind of approach mm -hmm. to, to baseline than just you know focused on literacy and, and numeracy skills. Um, so yeah, and, and another thing that teachers commented uh, in the feedback that they were doing now that they've undertaken the baseline assessment once, um, and some of the teachers have been involved in the piloting of it anyway um that when they were undertaking it actually that they had created their own kind of cue sheet um note sheets so they could make notes as well as an administering the assessment mm -hmm. from what i gather that strictly that's strictly forbidden because it's a very mm -hmm. this is the script this is what you do mm -hmm. you're not allowed to prompt children you're not allowed to support them you know it's very mm -hmm. clinical um in how it's delivered yeah. um which again teachers found frustrating they said it's just not natural this is mm -hmm. not how we work with children at this age you mm -hmm. know this so is if not they need to rephrase something because they understand the child is struggling or perhaps even feeling uncomfortable with the question yeah they can't do um, that. so so officially they're not allowed but again um this also throws a spanner in the works in terms of a reliability across the country because mm -hmm. you know there might be teachers who are doing it because they've got the mm -hmm. children's best interests at heart so they're saying actually what about this and what about that you know and then maybe they're scoring higher on their mm -hmm. rba results and a teacher who's totally followed the script mm -hmm. you know so so yeah i mean there's this huge areas um for consideration around that but these are also the considerations that i think the department for education um don't want to acknowledge you know mm -hmm. it's they're just interested in that end data um mm -hmm. you know they're interested in those results um and which uh, alice bradbury calls the data double of you know of a child so mm -hmm. the child himself um lose importance it's the data mm -hmm. they generate yeah. that then becomes important which then actually moves away from the lived realities of of, of children um mm -hmm. you know because you're looking at the 
Yeah, well, they're not even a number. It's, it's the number they produce that becomes a value. Oh, you know, it's even worse than, than they <laughs> just become. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and then not only mm-hmm. that, it's then the cohort produces this this value and then the mm-hmm. school produces this value. And it, and it's a very dehumanization. You know, it's it's it totally reduces our lived experience as people um, to an abstract, an abstract number. Yeah, which mm-hmm. actually becomes... Um, anything but representative of the reality um mm-hmm. so i mean it's a real this isn't just the reception baseline this is happening mm-hmm. you know across education it's also happening across society um mm-hmm. you know and i'm not a total kind of oh we shouldn't datify anything you know but but i really believe that data should kind of drive inclusion um and promote kind of diversification of things and, and access um and not this reductionist kind of model because actually what the reception baseline is doing um, and lots of the current assessments that around datafication um it's just reproducing the faults of an old system Mm -hmm. you know we're not coming up with any transformative innovative Mm -hmm. you know new ways of assessing children we're Mm -hmm. just using tool digital tools to assess and measure children in ways that they've been assessed and measured um, already before for many many years yeah mm. well it seems like all <laughs> very negative and I know we've kind of talked before <laughs> that the fact that you can actually try and get something out of this you know because teachers have to do the assessment there's no way out it's it's like how well how do they make the most of it you know one of the things you said some of them try and get to use that time to get to know the child a little because it's one-to-one are there any other things from your research that teachers kind of took from the baseline assessment and managed to kind of use out of it in terms of any positivity i think um one of the most radical and innovative ones uh comment responses and it was only one response but i've it's really stuck with me Mm. um and that was that a teacher said that their senior leadership team were actually going to support with the reception baseline assessments for next year Mm -hmm. So to minimise the amount of time that teacher spends out of class, but also to introduce the SLT team to the new cohort so they Mm -hmm. could administer parts of the RBA and see, kind of get a a feeling for where the children were at, um, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and actually get to know them on a one-to-one basis. And for the SLT to start to reform, you know, uh, form some of the relationships with with the reception age children. Um, And I just thought how lovely, you know, Mm -hmm. actually what is quite a challenging situation. Mm -hmm. But to read responses like that, it really shows you basically what teachers and, and you know, senior leadership teams are faced with, but also how resourceful. Um, and again, if you flip it to the child being at the centre of that and your decision mm-hmm. making around a child, um, I mean, what a great solution. It really, um, you know, I kind of, I read that and read it a few times. I thought, wow, you know, that's the sort of school I would love to work mm-hmm. at. Yeah. You know, and that's yeah. the sort of school I'd love to send my children to because if the leadership are taking that approach, you know, in something mm-hmm. like this through statutory assessment, you know, what other fantastic things must they be doing as well? Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, that was that was a real kind of highlight. Um, a, another common one was, um, you know, teachers actually making their own notes during reception baseline assessment and then making a kind of a, a um, a class portfolio and celebrating with their class what they were really good at. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Yeah, you know, and again, turning it into a positive and saying, mm-hmm. right, you know, you've all done really well at this. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what we're going to do next. And and actually, one of these areas was one of the areas that we, you know, that, that I think we really need to work on. So using it, you know, giving them their own feedback loop. Mm-hmm. So the feedback loop for the child, the feedback loop for the teacher, um, you know, but again, my criticism of that would be is why is a teacher having to do all that extra work uh, yeah, when there's a statutory assessment that. in place? Mm, there's yeah. a lot for the teacher to do in that moment, you know, when they ha- are having to assess the children at this early stage yeah. whilst they still get to know them and at, from all the pressures of the academic year they're having anyway. And then they're trying to think of innovative ways of how to make this useful and, yeah, putting in all that extra time and effort. And I think it's a lot of thinking required in the moment as well when you're not just trying to carry out this statutory assessment you're also trying to make sure that 
that there is some use for yourself and the child and and the families as well i guess yeah it's it's that it's it's giving value to assessment and you know mm. assessment that without value is useless um mm. you know um and so yeah really just really positive things and and one of one of the other things was this whole idea of we're doing it because we have to not that we want to um mm. but actually we're going to make it work um because mm-hmm. that's our job and that's our role and and this sense of professionalism came really came mm-hmm. through um there was a there was a big sense of frustration but that sense yeah. of professionalism and and i think that's really important to report on as well because after you know um the austerity the, the funding cuts for pandemic you know there's still that um level of professionalism and and you know i, I keep coming back to the best interests of, of children mm-hmm. um because it's really important that they are central to decisions that have been made. And I'm sure there's another side from a DFE about, you know, this having the best interests of children as well. I struggle mm-hmm. to see it personally, but I'm sure there is. <laughs> um, because I see it as a part of the bigger mechanisms of how, you know, governments and metrics and so on work. Um, mm-hmm. But um, it, it was it was quite apparent that it's being done to teachers. <laughs> Mm-hmm. and children yeah. you know and and they're just going to make the best of, of the situation but those um you know those solutions you just sit there and i was really i remember reading them and thinking wow you know i wouldn't have thought of that um mm-hmm. the slt one really uh, blew mm-hmm. me away and i just thought you know it's incredible and i've actually shared that quite often with people in discussions um mm-hmm. and i've had head i had a head teacher say to me that's a really good idea, you know, mm-hmm. that's a really yeah. good idea. Um, you know, I can't do all of them, but if I can get in there and yeah. do a few of them and actually some of the other SLT, you know, and phase leaders and so on, go in and take some of that as well. Um, you know, the whole, I use this phrase for my children all the time, as I'm sure you've heard it, sharing is caring, you know, mm-hmm. and it, and it is, yeah. it's, it's, it's simple solutions to quite complex issues, mm-hmm. um, which I like around it. Mm-hmm. And it is really important to share good practice and it's so vital to be able to empower each other, you know, different educators empowering others and, and whole schools as well. So just to kind of start wrapping up this episode as well, what would you say now to teachers who are conducting the baseline assessment and maybe who are very new to it? Because this episode is being published in September. Um, so a lot of teachers are conducting the assessment now or will be in the next few weeks. What kind of um I guess tips would you give probably <laughs> because they have yeah, to I, I, get on with it. Yeah. Um, one of the things I haven't spoke around here, but that kind of um, was an undercurrent to this was the importance mm. of, you know, planning it, um, you know, estimating how many children you've got, how long is it going to take mm. you? Um, there's a literacy based assessment. There's a numeracy based assessment. Doing them both back to back isn't, isn't realistic. Um, so although there's government guidance, it will only take you 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, with anything with children often takes a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, um, so be generous to yourself in planning those times. Make sure you can um, reach out for, you know, talk to your senior leaderships about what's going to happen when I'm out of the class. You know, make sure there's that, that support for your children mm-hmm. and whoever else is in, in the classroom as well. Um, and to... You know, just take it kind of one child at a time. It will get faster, hopefully. For, for some, the more you kind of um, work through it, the more familiar you'll get, although questions are going to go different ways. And the kind of sentiment of, of each assessment um, is similar. Um, make it work for you. Um, you know, do not spend time in your baseline assessment, your internal baseline assessment, if you're doing one, which the majority of the survey responses said they did, um, going over the same stuff that's been covered in reception baseline assessment. So try and make it complementary. Um, and lastly, if you can get your senior leadership on board to administer it, then I'd go for it. You know, you don't know if you don't ask, do you? Mm, yeah, yeah, there's some really good points there. And I'm sure that this episode itself and and the insight into your research and your personal experience as well will generate a lot of discussion and probably debate as well as data itself is a very controversial topic um but yeah it's what we want we want more people talking about this um so yeah thank you very much david thanks for coming on
no problem thank you for having me great um so our listeners can find out more on the voice of early childhood website and we're back again for the next episode next week Thank you.